Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone. I know there are people um, joining us and introducing themselves in the chat. Um, great to see so many people from different parts of the world. So good morning, afternoon, evening, uh, or night, wherever you wherever you may be in the world. Um, delighted to welcome you to this IIED debate. So looking ahead to 2024, what's in store for climate and nature? where we are also going to take a moment to reflect on uh, COP at the end of last year. And we're particularly going to look at issues relevant to the least developed countries in this discussion. Just to say that we are recording this session. Um, you have an opportunity to share questions throughout in the Q&A function below. Please do use that. And we'll be taking time later in the event to channel questions to our fabulous panelists. Um, and I just wanted to say at the start, for those of you who were hoping to join us in person in London, sincere apologies for the last minute changes. I think we were all taken by surprise by the uh, the the extent of our rail strike in the UK today. So um, uh, thank you for bearing with us in that late change of plans and really pleased you've been able to join us online. Um, and a big thanks to everybody involved behind the scenes in organising today's session. Um, I really hope we do have a a stimulating debate. So my name's Tom Mitchell. I'm the director of IIED, and I'll be your host for the session today. Um, and the way it will run is that we will have a set of prepared questions for our panelists, and then uh, some quick follow-ups, and then plenty of time, we hope, at the end of the session for you to ask questions to the panelists too. Um, and then I suppose just setting the scene for what we're going to talk about today, um, well, we're going to reflect on why COP28 was so important, um, what happened there, what the implications are for uh, particularly least developed countries, and then looking ahead to 2024, what can we expect, and possibly even beyond to Brazil as well, for um, it would be COP30 then in, in Brazil um, in 2025. And also remembering that 2024 is a year where we have a double COP. So we have COP16 in Colombia coming up uh, in the second half of October. And then we have COP29 in Azerbaijan um, that is going to be in the middle of November this year. And then even before that, we've got so many important events, including the G20. We've got uh, the Summit of the Future in New York in September. We've obviously got a huge number of elections through this year that will shape the tone. And and, and particularly, uh, I think the US election is one that obviously everybody's waiting to see the outcome with, with bated breath. And then the other thing I think, of course, that many people are beginning to turn their attention to is that one of the really big topics in 2024 is uh, what are we going to do about climate finance? What, are, what is the new long-term goal on climate finance? And what does that mean in the context, really, of very challenging geopolitical relationships? I think the other thing I just wanted to note is that we continue to reflect on the life and extreme contribution that Salim al Haq has made to this field, hugely valuable uh, in the way in which uh, he has shaped the international agenda, has put least developed countries at the center of that. And Salim really does stay uh, close to our hearts. And and certainly my personal reflection of being at COP28 is that we really had some lovely opportunities uh, um, to, um, to, to have Salim's memory play a really important part in shaping the discussions that we have in COP20, uh, we had at COP28. And certainly on IIED's part, we look forward to um, the launch of the Salim al Huck uh, Scholarship and Prize um, that will be in April, that will be dedicated to supporting early career researchers from least developed countries and small island developing states, particularly those um, bringing forward research on loss and damage. So that's going to certainly be a key feature of what we do at IIED this year. So let me just introduce you then to the panellists. Um, before I pass over to them directly. I'm delighted to have um, Madeline Duf Saar here, who was the chair of the Least Developed Countries Group right up until the end of COP in December 2023. Um, Madeline still stays on, of course, as the head of climate change division in Senegal's Ministry of the Environment, um, Sustainable Development and Ecological Transition. And um, we're also welcoming Professor Jim Ski, um, the 
chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, and uh, newly with and hosted by IIED. So delighted to have you, Jim. Um, to Yamakani Idris, who is part of the the Malawian leadership that takes up the mantle of the least developed countries chair as it passed from Senegal to Malawi. Um, Yamakani is uh, is uh, been a long-standing partner of IIEDs and is an environmental officer in the Ministry of Natural Resources. And to our own Nicola Sorsby, researcher in IIEDs Natural Resources and Climate Change Research Groups. So um, welcome to you as panelists. And I would encourage you as panelists, if you can, to have your cameras on, if at all possible, if the bandwidth allows. But equally, we understand um, that people are coming in from different parts of the world and that sometimes can be challenging. But Madeline, maybe first I can turn to you. Um, how did you experience kind of COP28 outcomes? And what did you think, um, what did you get from the LDC group's perspective? And how would you look at the year ahead? Over to you. Thank you, Tom. I, I have put my camera on, but I don't know if it's, uh, you can see me. But, we can uh, see you. We can uh, see uh, you well, you. Madeline. We can see you very well. Okay, great. Good. So, thank, thank uh, for EID for inviting us uh, to this uh, important uh, discussion. Uh, uh, looking ahead at uh, COP twenty four, coming from uh, COP twenty eight, and also uh, give me this opportunity to to really thank also. Uh, all LDC's uh, uh, countries uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, to chair the LDC group uh, last year and the year before, from COP27 to COP28. And uh, I think it's a really um, a big an opportunity for LDC's countries uh, during these two years to work ahead uh, some uh, high important uh, Topic who are really uh, uh, really important for us is the issue of uh, lost and damage, is the issue of uh, the global goal on adaptation, and also the issue of how to keep online uh, align the 1.5 degrees Celsius has been uh, uh, recommended by the IPCC. So COP27 and COP28, in particular COP28, allow us to be able really in a uh, uh, under the uh, uh, chairmanship and the leadership of the uh, COP28 presidency. Uh, UNA, I think uh, we need to recognize that we were been able to finalize uh, uh, the decision around the lost and damaged fund. Uh, and it was really something that uh, was been really welcomed by all, all, all parties, particularly the most vulnerable countries. Another element also is to ensure that this fund is uh, also uh, been uh, receiving some resources. So we have been able to have uh, a preliminary resource uh, from a partner. This is really also something we need to 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 to, to welcome. We're looking for having more because uh, the demand for lost and damage is important, particularly for these developing countries, for small islands. A state and the fact is we are victim of climate change. So saying that having this uh, uh, great uh, static of this COP28 is something we need to really uh, address and also to underscore this uh, leadership of the UNA presidency. We also been able to discuss around the, uh, the, 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 the global goal on adaptation is really key for LDC. Uh, we are not being able maybe to have clarity regarding how we will finance uh, this uh, global call on adaptation, but we expect in the coming, uh, in this year, uh, we will continue discussing on the finance uh, around the adaptation, uh, uh, um, who is also really important for LDCs. As LDCs, adaptation is key. We need to adapt. We don't we, we, we are already facing the high cost of adaptation, of uh, high cost of uh, consequences from uh, climate change. We are suffering with uh, 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 many hazards from climate change. And I know that uh, uh, the IPCC 
uh, uh, chair here with us, so we really come on IPCC recommendation. So seeing that we are really uh, looking for having uh, more uh, clarity regarding finance around adaptation. And as I say, we underscore this uh, decision to continue working on the global goal on adaptation, starting uh, with uh, all being agreed around the, the some 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 global decision around adaptation, like the planning aspect of adaptation, ensuring that all LDCs will be having a NAPS, a national adaptation plan. Uh, elaborate, looking for the implementation of NAPS. This is really key also, and I hope uh, uh, from this decision we will see more support uh, to help LDCs to implement, to develop their NAPS, and knowing that all not, no LDC will be behind regarding the planning of NAPS. We have been able also during this COP28 uh, uh, COP to discuss around uh, 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 how to achieve the 1.5 uh, uh, degree by 2020, by 2050. It was really a, a difficult discussion, but we need to recognize that we have been able to really bring the issue of how we will treat in, uh, uh, in, in, in the coming year, uh, the, 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 the issue of fossil fuel. It's important to be also uh, aware that uh, uh, we have been uh, doing COP28 uh, with uh, uh, the mobilization of all the society, all uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, non-state non, non actor to, to, to decide that we need to really move from a fossil fuel uh, to a clean uh, uh, energy. And the decision through the global stock take uh, was also an opportunity to make this high recommendation to all countries, to all parties, to all actors, that there is a need really to uh, revise our way of uh, dealing with uh, fossil fuel. And some key global uh, 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 objective was been also coming from the decision under the global stock take is really uh, to have a, a global objective on renewable energy, uh, to have also uh, uh, an opportunity really to, to, to integrate uh, uh, the work around uh, uh, deforestation, how to move uh, to, uh, to support deforestation. That is also something that is really important for LDCs. Many LDCs countries are also concerned by uh, uh, biomass energy and uh, having this support around uh, uh, how to limit deforestation in all country and having support for us for LDCs is also an opportunity to, to take on board. I want also to, to, to insist on the NDC implementation. We, having, uh, 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 we are looking for having uh, uh, our NDC to be uh, implemented. We have NDC since 2020, and the issue of how to implement these NDCs is key, in particular for LDCs. So also the decision to have some support uh, and to recommend more support for LDCs countries regarding the NDC uh, uh, implementation is something also we need to, to highlight here. So we're really looking uh, to work more this year around uh, uh, the, the, the global goal on adaptation, how to work on indicator, how to really ensure that uh, support is made and is available for countries regarding around the, the adaptation pillar, but also uh, how to start discussing on also the new goal on, on finance. So this was also a, a, an aspect that we were being not able to, to, to conclude as this year we will have to discuss on the new collective goal on uh, around finance. So this is something maybe uh, I want also to, to bring on the table and I will stop there uh, looking for more. Thank you very much, Madeline. Very, very uh, good to get your perspectives on the whole range of topics that are important to LDCs coming out of COP28. Um, and I suppose with that, we should pass to Yamakani, 
and particularly to look at the results of the global stock take and its kind of implications for for least developed countries. But actually, in advance of this session, we were also taking questions and inputs from from different participants. And so, Yamakani, I wonder whether you could also respond to a question from Ian Mayers from the UK government department, DEFRA, um, which looks at um, how can we use the evidence from extreme weather events and accelerated extreme weather events? Um, and, and how can we think about how least developed countries can tackle those, particularly relying on support and engagement of, of private finance and the finance sector? So you've got a big challenge there, Yamakani. So to look at the glo go goal, um, look at the outcomes of the global stock take for least developed countries, but also reflect on what the impacts of extreme weather events mean for finance mobilization. Can you hear us okay, Yamakani? You're on mute if uh, if that's making a difference. Yeah. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, let me appreciate uh, IID for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, as you have mentioned, I've been really part of the ID throughout my, my work in, in this area. So I really appreciate to join you also uh, to look at uh, what 2024 brings us um, as far as the uh, climate and nature is concerned. So Rob Stock Tech really was an opportunity for the least developed countries, especially this being the first one uh, since we agreed in Paris um, about the goal which we are all looking forward to. So as you understand, uh, for the LDCs, the only hope we have is to achieve the Paris Agreement goal because it's the one which brings us together to really tackle the climate change head on. So the global stock take was there to really try to assess the progress we have been making as far as implementing the Paris Agreement is concerned. And the two years has been so intense. We had inputs from all over the world, uh, stakeholders from the non-government side, the private sector, and everyone was involved in this rigorous work, and that was very massive. And um, it, we should really uphold uh, that uh, approach where we have all stakeholders being involved in making decisions. So first of all, uh, the group stock take identified the gaps, both under mitigation. We are not doing well as far as reaching the 1.5 degrees is concerned in line with the science. And we are not doing well in adaptation as well uh, because most of our countries, especially the least good countries, were still suffering from extreme weather events. As we are speaking now, a lot of LDCs are in a mess, uh, being affected by floods, droughts, and so on. Um, which is very catastrophic. So we are not doing well in adaptation and resilience building. And we are not doing well actually in finance, in the means of implementation. As you understand until now, the 100 billion which was promised hasn't been fulfilled and many other pledges which were made on finance and means of implementation were not. And this was highlighted uh, within the decision of the global stock take. And that was very important uh, because we really, first of all, needed to acknowledge that we are not doing well. And that's good for us, the LDCs, because we are being affected and we are not being supported enough. And then what was also key in the global stock take is the way forward. So as mentioned by the former chair, Madeline, there were quite concrete resolutions from the global stock take to support us to move forward. Uh, for instance, she mentioned on mitigation about the transitioning away from fossil fuels. So that was a massive decision. And we also saw decisions to do with doubling of adaptation finance within the group stock tech. And we also saw uh, the decision on um, how to strengthen the technology development and transfer as well as the capacity building within the LDCs. And that made the global stock tech decision to be fair for us as LDCs because some of the issues we are really addressed as, as far as the way forward is concerned. So what would be key in 2024 now is to look at how best 
do we put in practice the decision we made at COP28 under the first growth stock take? And that includes the work on enhancing ambition in revising our NDCs. And they are, our NDCs should be informed by the decision we've made under the growth stock take. So in a nutshell, uh, the growth stock take was very, um, I was very considering uh, the LDCs. So our issues were taken on board and we really liked the way that the stakeholders participated and we had a lot of good resolution there, including the cross-cutting issues on how we consider gender, um, uh, the migration and so on, the human rights. So there are quite a lot of good outcomes which were within uh, the group stop take decision. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Yeah, Makani, thank you very much. Very um, kind of rapid and comprehensive overview. I really appreciate that. Nicola, maybe I can turn to you now. Um, we're going to pick up also, of course, it's not just uh, climate change that we're covering here, but we're also looking at the nature dimensions too. And I wonder whether you could just help us to connect partly what happened at COP28 as well when it comes to nature and to food and so on. And equally, then how do we look forward to um, COP16 later in the year um, you're working on these issues. Give us some insights. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and hello to everyone joining us today. It's great to see so many people here. Um, thank you to the other panelists for the comments so far. I'm going to build up, build on those a little bit. Um, I'm going to slightly switch direction and talk a little bit about how the COP28 outcomes are relevant for nature and biodiversity. Um, and then also um, elaborate a little bit on the climate finance commitments that we're expecting to see later this year in 2024. Um, so starting then on kind of nature outcomes and links to the biodiversity COP, um, I think possibly the most important thing to say first is that COP28 was actually the first climate COP that we had since um, the agreement of the Global Biodiversity Framework, um, which of course happened at CBD COP one year previously in Montreal. Um, the Global Biodiversity Framework was a, a landmark agreement for protecting nature over the next 10 years, and this has been likened to the Paris Agreement in the climate space. So certainly with this in place, there were high expectations that um, with the GBF in the CBD, um, this would help to put nature on the agenda within the UNFCCC climate negotiations and help to hopefully begin to align these two quite separate policy processes. And we did start to see some progress on this at COP28. Um, one significant development which came at the end of the conference was that the UAE COP presidency put out a joint statement with the CBD presidency on climate, nature and people. Uh, and the kind of force behind the message of this was really pushing for a shared effort to address both climate and biodiversity together and stressing that this is actually the only way that we can achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement or the goals of the Global Biodiversity Framework. This was really significant. Uh, we also saw some positive steps forward in the global stock take, uh, which included a reference to the GBF um, and stressed the urgency for united action on both nature and climate. Um, and there was a target on nature and biodiversity included in the global goal and adaptation. So quite a few signs point, pointing towards a much stronger consensus that climate and nature should be addressed together rather than separate issues. Um, and also actually that the climate and biodiversity COPs should be aligned more to one another. So also linked to this, we had the Food Sustainability Declaration at COP28. This came in the first few days, I think, um, and this was really a significant agreement since it was the first time that the link had been made at the COP between food systems and climate. Um, and it's the first time that countries will be obligated to report on their emissions from food and agriculture as part of their NDCs. Food systems, of course, really sit at this juncture of nature, climate and people. Obviously, we need healthy food systems to survive um, and food systems depend on a healthy climate and thriving nature. So it's really essential in this area that we find a sustainable solution. The focus now, of course, is on turning this declaration into more meaningful action for change for food systems. So, for example, we're hoping to see increasing financial commitment to supporting smallholder farmers and smallholder producers. Uh, we know that they already spend billions of dollars of their own money adapting to climate change and protecting nature. Uh, and we're also hoping to see kind of more support going towards initiatives that support agrobiodiversity instead of large scale monocultures, which are high, high polluting and of course destroy nature as well. And then turning to look at climate finance, so some of the other panelists already touched on this, but we are expecting a draft decision text uh, ahead of COP29 on the new long-term climate finance goal, otherwise known as the new collective quantified goal or the NCQG. Um, this, of course, builds on previous goal, which was agreed back in 2009, almost 15 years ago now, that richer countries would provide $100 billion per year to developing countries to address climate change. And as we've already already heard, the next stock actually acknowledged that this goal 
goal was not reached in 2021. And so this is expe expected to be a really major focus of the coming year. There's lots of questions we need to see answered around the new climate finance goals, such as, for example, how much will it be for? But also where will that money come from? How is it going to be delivered? How will we measure progress against that goal to know if we've actually achieved it this time or not? Um, what we would really like to see from this goal is a real emphasis on the quality of the finance as well. So, for example, will it be delivered in a way which ensures it really reaches local actors instead of getting stuck um, in the hands of financial intermediaries and so forth? And of course, we need to see a, an increased commitment specifically to adaptation. And um, so back at Glasgow, there was a commitment made to double adaptation finance by 2025. So looking at how the new NCQG will respond to that and really help enable us to reach that goal as well is really important. And finally, we saw new pledges made at COP28 to um, the funders such as the Adaptation Fund and the Green Climate Fund, and also several funders opening funding windows which focus on locally led adaptation or LLA. So this is obviously all very positive, um, but we do now need to make sure that these commitments are followed through with action. Um, and we need to see real evidence of changes to funding delivery mechanisms which can help enable locally led adaptation uh, instead of just having empty commitments around LLA. So yeah, quite a lot to look forward to this year. Um, I'll leave it there. Back to you, Tom. Brilliant. Thank you, Nicola. I think if you're one of those um, one of those people who are I suppose, new or uh, uninitiated in the international architecture of tackling climate change in nature. You have a steep learning curve when it comes to uh, acronyms and topics. And I think NCQG is a new one for us um, to battle and probably the least elegant of all of the acronyms that we have to deal with. But undoubtedly, it's going to be a lot of discussion this year, of course. Yeah. Um, Jim, let me turn to you, um, last but not least, in terms of our panellists, and just ask you to reflect on COP28, and I suppose towards the double COPs this year, on what are the kind of implications for the IPCC? What do you take away from those uh, from the session in Dubai? Yeah, OK. Thanks, Tom. And can I just say how delighted I am to be participating in my first public meeting as an employee of IIED? Let, let's just say that, first of all. And uh, just to say, you might be surprised how little attention as IPCC people we pay to the negotiations when we go to a call. It's all bilateral side events, interviews. Where we do pen, tend to pay attention is where the decisions come about, where they mention IPCC, and in particular, where they invite IPCC to take particular action. So that's where I will, I, I will, will go to almost straight away. Lots of mentions of the IPCC sixth assessment, which we're very flattered by. But I think there are three relevant invitations uh, in the decision documents that I think are worthwhile flagging up. Um, the first one was in the global stock take uh, decision, inviting IPCC to consider how best to align its work with the second and subsequent global stock takes, and also to provide relevant and timely information for the next stock take. I'll come on to how IPCC has responded uh, to that one. Uh, the second two invitations I want to pick up are all about adaptation, which is a strong theme here. One of the invitations isn't to IPCC directly, it's to the subsidiary bodies to provide information relevant to the implementation of the Global Goal on Adaptation, including in relation to targets, indicators, metrics, methodologies, etc. And there is a specific mention there of collaboration with IPCC in achieving that objective. So that, that's something we, we've got on our agenda. And the third invitation, which actually goes back to the Sharm El Sheikh and COP27, is inviting IPCC to update its 1994 technical guidelines for assessing climate change impacts and adaptations. So I think that's, that would, these were three important invitations effectively that IPCC needs to consider. Now, IPCC had the first plenary of, of, the, of the new cycle in Istanbul two weeks ago, and it was a very fraught and difficult session. In classic IPCC style, finishing 16 hours late at 10 o'clock on a, on a Saturday morning. So this is all emblazoned in our memories. But just to summarize what IPCC decided, including how to respond to these invitations, it confirmed that there will be a special report on climate change in cities, and work on that is already underway. It confirmed that there will be three working group reports, as usual, uh, plus a synthesis report. 
It confirmed that there will be, that there's a bit of IPCC that everybody forgets, the task force on inventories, which is actually incredibly important. And it's going to be two, doing two methodology reports on short-lived climate forcers, but also on carbon dioxide removal technologies and carbon capture and storage, which has not been looked at for more than 20 years in IPCC, so it's well, well overdue. And there was a decision, indeed, to update these 1994 guidelines on, uh, on adaptation. And if I might just say on that, I must be the few people left who can remember it. I looked back to these 1994 guidelines and I discovered I was one of the experts that helped produce them. I have to say it slipped my memory, but I was reminded that I'd, I'd actually, actually done that. Uh, so we will be work, working on that. But one thing to say is that on these guidelines, they're procedurally, they're going to be done as part of the Working Group 2 report. So the scoping, the selection of authors, the lead authors meetings and the approval will all be part of the Working Group 2 report, but it will be produced as a distinct product, which is identifiable, which I think was important to a lot of de developing countries. So that's where we are. And just to flag up, I think this is going to be a strongly adaptation cycle for IPCC, there's going to be a lot of attention to it. And um, there's a lot of a burden actually on working group two on impacts adaptation and vulnerability, where I'm sincerely hoping, Tom, that IID can provide a little help because there's obviously so much expertise within within the, the, the IID system. Um, maybe just to finish off, because, because you, I can talk a bit, little bit in, in follow-ups about what the plans are for this year. But one thing to flag up is the links between the triple cri climate cr crisis of climate biodiversity and pollution. And this is something that's got a lot, a, quite a lot, lot of, of attention. I met with David Abura, the new chair of IPBES while in Dubai. And we will both be going to the UN Environment Assembly at the end of next month, where there will be a side event on the scientific links between the different assessments and how they can they can help to work together uh, with, with each other. And just to say, I don't think it, it, it is particularly helpful to try and think about how we all change our procedures in order to collaborate. David and I are agreed that the best route forward is what you might call soft collaboration within our existing mandates, where we look at issues like glossaries, coordinated scenarios, uh, shared workshops, these kinds of issues, because there are actually many obstacles to us sort of you know, using, uh, there, are, there are big differences in the, the way IPCC has working groups, uh, it best does not. There are also uh, different approaches to the use of private and philanthropic funding that would be really quite difficult. To, difficult. So we can think of softer ways of, of moving forwards. And just finally to say, I mean, IPCC did have a lot of links and conversations with the COP28 presidency. And in Dubai, we had already started conversations with Azerbaijan on the COP29 presidency. And they are very much saying uh, they intend that their COP will be a science-based COP. As there are only 20,000 hotel beds in Baku, it's going to be a much smaller COP than, than the, the, the one in Dubai. So a little more focus uh, may, may be there as well. And I'll finish there. Thank you, Jim. Let's wait until see whether there's cruise ships come into the port and so on. Let's, uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of logistics and planning to go on <laughs> before Baku. Um, but thank you very much. Very clear kind of summary of the expectations for the IPCC. So we've had a lot of questions, both in the chat window and in the Q&A below. Um, please do add questions to the Q&A. If you see, there is also an opportunity to upvote different questions by clicking on the little thumbs up. It will help us just be able to um, prioritize which questions get posed to the panelists. And I would also encourage the panelists, if you see something there that you can answer quickly or you want to jump in and use your spare time, then, then please do so. You have the opportunity to provide some written answers. But we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. But maybe I can turn back to the panelists just very, very briefly for a sound bite. I think very much about what you're looking forward to in 2024, what your expectations are. Nicola, maybe I can start with you. We'll just change the order a little bit. Um, 
What's your sense? Are you hopeful? Uh, is there something in 2024 you're particularly looking for as a signal for for uh, progress? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I definitely say there's cause for hope this year. Um, so a couple of things just to mention, I guess you already touched on it earlier, but this year we have another double COP year. So COP29, of course, is going to come, I think, even less than a month after we have CBD COP in um, COP16, that is, in October. So certainly we're expecting dialogue around nature and alignment with developments in the CBD to be high at COP29. Um, and of course, you also mentioned earlier, we're already seeing momentum building around COP30 in Brazil, which, of course, will be the following year in 2025. Um, this COP is going to take place in Belém, which is an Amazon city in Brazil, and this does appear to be kind of a deliberate effort from the Brazilian COP presidency to really bring nature into the climate conversation by physically bringing the climate COP to one of the world's largest rainforests. So this is already also gearing up to be a major moment for nature in 2025. So the next two years, actually, I think we're expecting to see kind of strong action on both nature and climate and really weaving together these two narratives. Um, and there's a strong message emerging, of course, that climate, climate and nature crises should be addressed, not as separate things, but actually together as one. And then in relation to finance, I think we're hoping to see definitely an ambitious new goal for climate finance, which meets the needs of developing countries and delivers on adaptation. Whether this will happen, um, of course, we still don't know. We don't know what the outcomes of some of these elections will be, which may influence this. Um, but we're certainly hopeful at this stage. Uh, we would like to also see accountability from some major funders and finance providers to deliver quality finance, which can be accessed quickly and easily by local actors um, instead of kind of just false commitments around locally led initiatives. And finally, I'll just say it'd be nice to see a long term climate finance goal, which acknowledges that finance must deliver actually positive outcomes for both climate and nature um, if it's going to have meaningful impact and which align to the finance targets which we already have in the global biodiversity framework kind of aligning both of those things will be I think a really significant development um, and that you know there's hope that this could still happen this year there's plenty going on to look forward to. Thank you Nicola. Yamakani let me turn to you. Um, are you hopeful for 2024 and if so why? You're on mute there we go. Yeah thank you very much uh, for that question. Yes, so I'm, I'm uh, hopeful for 2024. Yeah, considering the uh, tremendous achievement we made at COP28, I think it sets a different pace in the uh, climate change uh, regime, um, especially one uh, looking at what happened uh, with loss and damage, having um, a decision made even during the end. Um, days of the COP. So it's really set a different pace that we really need to be acting as quick as we can uh, so that the the ties so let's concretize. So I, I believe that uh, we will then maintain that momentum uh, from COP28 uh, in 2023 to 2024. And as you can see, so uh, as the been highlighted by the previous speaker, uh, uh, COP30 is in Brazil, and we have seen already the Brazilians are being very active to try to also set their own ambitions as far as their hope is concerned. So I'm so hopeful that uh, in, COP, um, in COP29 uh, this year, we're going to maintain the momentum and indeed um, have great achievements. But more importantly, um, this will be the first COP, uh, the first year after the first growth stop day. So we expect um, parties to start putting into practice or implementing indeed the outcomes of the first growth stop. As, as I mentioned, um, one of the key outcomes is that uh, uh, the next NDCs, which are due next year in 2025, they are supposed to take on board uh, the decision we have made at COP29. So already it means the parties, as they are formulating their 2025 NDC, they have, should be referencing what we have agreed at COP29, as well as the other thematic areas like the new collective confide goal on climate finance. It's that the negotiations which will continue this year, they have to consider the outcomes of the first GST, uh, the global goal adaptation as well. So all the negotiations now will be centered on how we bring on board 
what we have agreed at COP29 and uh, at COP28 under uh, the Global Stock Tank. So I'm so hopeful and uh, looking forward to engage in this year so that we um, we are not but striving, we are really moving forward with addressing the gaps and challenges which we have identified uh, uh, through the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Yamakani, if I could just hold you there for one moment, I'm going to start addressing some of the questions that we've been getting. And I think there's one that we should pose to you, which is if you were in charge of setting the new quantified target for climate finance, what level would you set it at? Yeah, thank you. In terms of the, the, the actual amounts, yeah, so the amounts needed are quite a lot. <laughs> So then, I, what I could do to to really have uh, the figure to set up that goal is to look at um, the needs of the developing countries as far as the NDC are concerned. So we have identified our needs. For example, uh, uh, for Malawi, we need around uh, uh, fifty point two million US dollar billion US dollars to implement our NDC. So I could nearly look at that, especially for the most vulnerable countries like the LDC and SEEDS to look at their needs and what are their financial requirements for them to achieve their NDCs as well as to build their adaptation and resilience in their country. So that could be um, a way forward for me to identify the actual figures to set up the new uh, collective and quantified goal on climate finance. Thank you, Yamakani. Thank you. Jim, I'm not going to ask you the same question. Um, you'll be relieved to know. Um, but what I might do is is combine that sense of, if you were talking about COP29 in Azerbaijan being a science COP, I'd like to press you a little bit more on what that might mean in practice. And then also there's a couple of questions here that I might address to you. Um, one is, um, for AR7, do you expect to see um, culture and heritage be included within the AR7 cycle? And equally, is there any chance of a special report coming up or or at least chapters related to climate change and child rights um, as, a, as a question posed here? If you could address well, those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just to, to start from, from the back end first, there, there will be no other special reports other than cities in this cycle. That is a firm decision uh, that governments take. So any other topics will be need to be scoped into the standard working group reports in order to, to get them covered. And there will probably be a scoping meeting before the end of this year. And that, that is the uh, is the point at, at, at which it would actually come in. I know you weren't going to ask me about finance, but could I, could, could I just uh, come back on it br briefly? I mean, we've heard uh, the, the, the number quite a lot in terms of the quantitative amount. It's very clear that, that, that what the real needs are in the trillions level. Uh, you, that, 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 that is, is what we would have to, have to be speaking about. And IPCC would covered finance quite comprehensively in its working group three report on mitigation, but there's a lot more work needing, on, needing to be done on adaptation in the next cycle. And one of the ambitions of myself and the working group co-chairs is to have much more linkage between the working groups. So perhaps finance could be dealt with in a more comprehensive way rather than divided artificially into adaptation uh, and, and mitigation when we go into the next cycle. And uh, a, a science-based COP29, that is a discussion we would need to explore with the Azerbaijani presidency to, to, to understand there. I mean, there, there was an awful lot of reference and reliance on IPCC in the decision documents at COP28. And that, that is the same signal that we are getting from the COP29 presidency at the moment as well. It's to be explored. And Jim, maybe if you could stay on for just a second, I think there's um, there's a couple of other questions here related to the IPCC. I think one is um, from a colleague, Megan Rowling. You referred to the, the recent meeting in Istanbul as fraught. Can you just elaborate maybe a little bit on that? I think particularly from the perspective of why do you think that that was so fraught? Um, yeah, go with that one for now. Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, the, the, the issue is that we have decided, the government's decided what reports they produce in the next cycle, but they did not decide when they are going to be produced. And that is absolutely critical. 
And so what, what we came out of was that the Bureau, that's the elected scientific leadership of IPCC, will need to produce proposals on a timetable for the next plenary, which will take place in late July. And there the firm decisions about a timetable would actually be reached. And I think the tension there in the discussion, if I can reduce it to one dimension, it's this question, what is available for the second global stock take versus how comprehensive the scientific assessment can be? And the, that was really the axis of, along which a lot of the debate was taking place. So uh, the, the working group co co working group co-chairs assure us that they can produce three working group reports in time for the second global stock take. But the question is, how comprehensive there will be? Will there be a new initiatives that might be missed because the cutoff dates with the literature are too early? That's the kind of issue we need to discuss. And does that mean a more accelerated process than in previous years, given uh, the timing? In, in, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, indeed. And governments have also been calling for shorter and more focused, less verbose reports. So we are actually giving active consideration to how the IPCC reports could really truly focus on what is new rather than being encyclopedias of all the knowledge that has ever, ever been produced. I mean, the literature on climate change is doubling every cycle. It's an enormous challenge, which we have to give some consideration to. Uh, this question of focus on what is new rather than summarising everything that is possibly known about climate change is a challenge we need to address. Thank you, Jim. Right, we'll come back when we've got some other questions, but let me pass to Madeline. Madeline, maybe I could ask you equally the same question about what are you looking forward to for, for 2024 and what are some of the key topics? But maybe one of the other questions that has been raised that partly follows on from Yamakani's answer about financing needs, what do you see as the, the, the big sources of finance that you're going to need, Senegal being one example of a country needing that finance? What do you see as those big sources? And What's your expectation for how much of this should come from public funds opposed to other sources? But Madeline, over to you. Thank, thank you, Tom, for this uh, question. Uh, regarding the resources, as been said by, 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 by Yami Kani, uh, we, we, we're talking about trillion of, uh, of, of uh, US dollar being available uh, in order really to help developing countries really to implement by NDCs and also uh, move in a, a, a low carbon development and pathway and also uh, tackle the issue of adaptation and and, and, and lost and damage. So I think uh, we're talking about, uh, as we say, a lot of money available in order really to, 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 to support uh, 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 countries, uh, in particular small uh, vulnerable countries. Uh, I just want to mention this resource is not really so big compared to what we see going for uh, uh, for some uh, uh, crisis we saw in the world for the COVID, uh, for also uh, the war we see between uh, Ukraine and 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 Russia. So uh, the international community was been able to mobilize really in a short period uh, this resource. So it's not so much as we we might thinking. This is possible to mobilize, you know, really to, 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 to tackle the issue of climate change. And I think this is key. And in, in order also to, to, to fix the 1.5 by 2050, I think this is key. So we can do that. So saying that for Senegal, I think, uh, yes, we're looking for public fund. We're looking for public support coming from the global uh, international world in order to tackle the issue of adaptation. It's really key for us. We are in Senegal uh, 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 facing uh, the issue of uh, coastal erosion uh, with its implication, uh, uh, soil salinization, loss of land, uh, the issue also of uh, uh, agriculture. We having really uh, uh, some uh, high uh, pressure around uh, the agriculture productivities due to really uh, uh, climate change uh, 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 problem, uh, lack of uh, rain uh, or, or having uh, some problem with also uh, uh, flood. Uh, we, we need to, to, to deplace some population and, and provide them a new uh, area. So this is a lot of cost for small countries like us. We are LDCs, so having to face that 
for a country having a small budget, national budget, you, you can see how 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 difficult it is for our government and how uh, how how kind of uh, pressure they are having at the political level due to something that uh, we are not uh, uh, responsible. So this is what I want to say. So these resources can come from have to come from the global world. We're looking for a grant. We're looking also for highly highly concessional uh, support if uh, we need to to invest on some infrastructure. So this is also something we have to discuss with bank uh, and with the support of the global communities on 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 the process uh, to 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 really make this uh, support as uh, what we call a solidarity support for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, yes, lots of comments in the chat and others about the nature of finance. This question of loans and grants and sources of funding and so on. And I wonder, Nicola, maybe I could turn to you. There's several questions equally related to locally led adaptation, localization. Everybody's talking about getting money where it matters, how to kind of rethink the international financial system to get money to the communities on the front line much more efficiently. Some, I think, in the questions have even suggested we need to do away with implementing agencies and, you know, get rid of some of the pipe work and so on. I know this is a topic that you and, and colleagues here in IIED work on a lot, but can you give your sense of, of I suppose, issues of quality of finance, not just quantity of finance, which I suppose threatens to to dominate? What's your view on that? Yeah, thanks, Tom. So, yeah, I see, saw several questions coming through about this. And as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing kind of quite an increased focus on locally led adaptation, community based adaptation, these sorts of initiatives, which is obviously really great and really positive that there's kind of this recognition, recognition building that finance does need to reach the local level in order for it to be effective and kind of not get stuck kind of further up in the delivery chain with intermediaries, implementing agencies, etc. But I think what's really important to recognize here is that this does need to be a kind of almost like whole of society or like whole system change. It's not just a case of addressing one, you know, one small LLA initiative at the local level or, you know, what another at a different level. It really needs to be um, almost like a change in consciousness, I guess, of how really how we deliver finance and um, who is accountable for that finance and making uh, increasing kind of downward accountability for that. Um, this is something that IID has been working on for quite some time, and we've had recently received support from the Netherlands government, which will support us and some partners to grow our work on LLA over the coming five years. And one of this, like this issue is exactly the key, which we're wanting to look at, kind of generating further ambition on LLA to really scale it up. Um, so it becomes more of like, could I say, an LLA movement, maybe, rather than just, um, you know, something that's happening here and there, but really isn't kind of widely taken up. There are a few great examples of where this is already happening. Um, certainly in Bangladesh, they have a national platform for LLA. Um, this is a space at the national level where funding can come in and be influenced by local organizations. And it would be really great to see something similar happening perhaps at other, in other countries, other country governments. Um, and there is already an LLA community of practice where organizations and governments who have endorsed the principles for LLA can kind of come together and share experiences on this. Um, and we have been seeing um, more and more organizations come to endorse these principles, which is really promising kind of and, and hopeful for the future that we will start to see um, changes trickling through into the way finance is delivered. So there's plenty of existing initiatives and examples already, but we're really hoping to scale this up and see new ones emerging and in a way that we can where we can bring together actors from kind of all levels of society um, public sector, private sector um, and everywhere to work on LLA um, as we move forward with the work. A really good point. Thank you, Nicola. And I think others are always commenting that locally led doesn't mean just about getting money to the local level. It's also about the mindset, the approach, the, as you said, the system shift that we need to see that puts puts greater, I suppose, ownership and, and guidance um, from local communities at the heart of that process. But I think you highlighted some really good examples. Jim, let me turn back to you. A couple of questions for you. And I suppose this is this is kind of channeling some of the journalists here that are saying, um, what's your perspective on the 1.5 degree uh, target and when that could be breached and what are the implications for that? And then secondly, what does the IPCC's view on this question of climate finance needs and sources? Is that something that the IPCC has given guidance on before? And, and, and how should we think about the, the contribution that IPCC make, can make to this, this key, key topic? 
Yeah, uh, on the first one, Tom, I think it depends what you mean by the 1.5 target, because conventionally it is meant to mean the middle of a 20 year average, which means in principle you will never know till 10 years after the event whether you've actually actually passed it. And I think that is still technically possible to do that within the, tw the, the 21st century. But that does not mean that we will not breach 1.5 degrees in individual years, including within this decade, possibly. You, you, th that, that could certainly happen on working group uh, one of IPCC in the last cycle. I think I said it, it was likely that it would be breached, even in some of the more ambitious uh, mit mit mitigation scenarios. Uh, the, 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 the second question, Tom, just remind me, me again. Yeah. Was what, what's the IPCC's right. view on this topic of climate finance and particularly yeah. the needs, but also the sources. Many people are talking about the fact yeah. that there's really stretched public funding available. Yeah, yeah. So what, what are the ways in which the IPCC yeah. has assessed that, that, that funding yeah. needs could be met? Yeah, I mean, just as I said earlier, I think this was done more thoroughly in working group three in the last cycle on mitigation, where frankly the quantified information is easier is easier to easier to pick up on. And I think the big difference between adaptation and mitigation is that there's a lot of private finance going into mitigation, whereas adaptation funding is almost entirely from public sources. And I th think one of the things that IPCC will need to to deal with in the next, next cycle is this question of where private finance might be available on the adaptation side as well. If Madeline's absolutely right, there's enough money in the world to deal with these problems. It's a question of how you get it to the right places. And at the level of trillions, it probably needs private finance as well as public finance to make it happen. And I guess my hope would be if we do more work on indicators, metrics, targets, etc that you can actually produce indicators that would allow adaptation projects to be bankable in a bigger way for the private sector in the future. That's a bit of speculation, but honestly, I don't think that your public purses are going to be uh, are deep enough to deal with all the challenges. And we are going to need to think much more about the issue of how you get private finance focused on adaptation as well as on mitigation, which has happened in the past, where quite frankly, the metrics are easy for mitigation. Carbon dioxide equivalent is there as a number. The metrics aren't really there on the adaptation side at the moment. Thank you, Jim. And then maybe I'll pass the last comment of this session to, to Yamakani. Yamakani, let me give you a choice of questions to answer. Um, one of them relates to the impact of elections this year. Obviously, there are so many elections around the world. How do you see the impact of those elections shaping what's possible at COP29? Um, and I suppose the second question is, from the perspective of, of least, least developed countries now having to deal with huge impacts of climate change, but also make choices about energy futures, whether to exploit fossil fuel resources, whether to consider not doing that and look for other sources and so on. How do you see that kind of balancing act or, or kind of, you know, development choices really shaping the way in which um, politicians lead in, in the countries you're most familiar with? Yeah, thank you very much for the two important questions. So, uh, first of all, on the elections, yeah, that's a very important, and uh, um, it's something which uh, for us LDCs sometimes it really becomes a huge concern, uh, um, because it's mainly um comes a, an issue where um, uh, the leaders whom we all look upon uh, when they are really not pro climate change, yeah, so it becomes a very big problem. Uh, for us, so we are hoping for, for the best. Uh, to make sure that uh, uh, those who are elected, uh, really, are uh, those who understand that uh, climate change is real, and indeed it affects the most vulnerable countries most. Uh, because we have nothing to do with climate change, but the impacts are so high. So we are hoping that um, the outcomes of the elections. Uh, in the sense that those who be having the leadership, uh, those who 
support or are also concerned about uh, the climate change and who, those who need to do action. Otherwise, uh, we are, it will be a major setback um, for the world as, as far as climate change is concerned, uh, considering that, as I mentioned earlier on, the momentum we have built uh, coming from COP28, COP27, the issues of loss and damage are now there everyone understands there's the huge impacts we all need to take action in addressing the loss and damage and uh, the issue of group stock take the gaps are quite clear and now we had the issue of transitioning away from fossil fuel so all this to be in practice we need leaders who will drive uh, this agenda way forward so we are hoping for the best in in in, in that regards but now coming to the second question on um, balancing the development and climate action. Uh, for us, we believe that for the LDC, is, it's not a matter of choosing uh, which way to go. So it's a matter of survival. So we need to consider uh, climate change as a developmental issue indeed. So in our perspective, giving the LDCs and the most vulnerable countries enough support to address climate as well as the development needs. I think there'll be no way of coming back to do the fossil fuels and, and, and so on. Because what lacks now is the need to drive the sustainable development in most of the vulnerable countries. So as long as we have enough support, enough means of implementation, enough um, resources to address our energy poverty in our countries, as well as the developmental needs, I think there will be no way um, LDCs will be happy to uh, do more um, emissions mm. uh, because currently our emissions are most negligible. Um, and indeed, as LDCs, we are driving the 1.5. It's the LDCs who have been making sure that we keep the 1.5 degrees alive. So there's no way LDCs we can go back to say uh, we need to um go away with the 1.5 because it's a matter of survival for us so as long as there is enough resources i repeat as long as we have enough resources uh to help us do away from um um bad energy to scale out the renewable energy for example the solar and other hydroelectric energies that will continue and you see that most of the ldc's they are are more renewable sources in their energy uh, mix. So we hope that that support will continue and it will be scaled out more. And from the um, COP28, we saw the declarations as well as agreements, uh, which um, assures us that there'll be scaling up of renewable energy sources. So as long as that reaches the LDCs who are most needing uh, those technologies, then there will be no need to to do uh, the fossil fuels. Thank you, Thank you Yamakani, and um, and we are going to have to close it there. We're we're over time, but can I just say a big thanks to everybody who's contributed, whether it's with questions or responses to what you've heard, um, and certainly to our panelists. Please join me in thanking um, Madeline and Yamakani and Jim and Nicola, which I think has been an. In incredible session in terms of the coverage of lots of different topics huge numbers of of issues being raised and there's certainly a lot of a lot of um perspectives on on finance too um and so just to reflect that 2024 is going to be one of those years where everybody involved in this um this this kind of movement to tackle climate change and the nature crisis is going to have to deal with many many different factors many steps along the way lots of opportunities to meet and uh, really do look forward to IAED playing a, a really key supportive role in the agenda this year. Um, and again, big thanks to everybody who's helped organize this session. Really sorry we weren't able to get to the location in London to host people in, in person, but really do look out for future IAED debates uh, and, and podcasts coming out very shortly. But thank you very much. Thanks again to the panelists and, and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.